Yeah, good morning. Hello, everyone. I am Joachim Griesbaum, one of the organizers of the conference. Shall I go ahead? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tessie Tarutin. Uh, and I'm a faculty at the Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce from Pune in India. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the conference. My name is Sophie Merz, and I am one of the instructors from Germany in the project of the Intercultural Learning Scenario. And I'm happy to spend the day with you together and talk about the different perspectives on intercultural information literacy. Hello, I'm Ginny Jacob, and I'm from India, Pune, India. And I'm glad to be a part of this Intercultural Perspectives on Information Literacy, the conference that is going to be held. Thank you. Hello from me too. I'm Theresia Woltermann. Uh, I also work on the project team. Um, I'm from, from Germany, Hildesheim University, and I'm also very happy to uh, yeah, experience this day together with you. So, hello again, everyone. We all greet you and we all welcome you very warmly to our first on conference on intercultural perspectives on information literacy, which is the final point of a transnational online course and <clears throat> uh, in the last winter term. And before we start with the conference, before we go and head into the single sessions we want to give you a short overview of the yeah of the project and on the on the conference today and why are we here what is the the idea what are our aims with uh, this kind of project and learning scenario and conference um, our idea or our aim and goal is that we um, yeah achieve two things First, that we foster intercultural learning by providing students a learning scenario um, that, is, that goes beyond single culture. At the moment, we are consisting of German students and uh, Indian students. We hope that we will uh, expand furthermore in, in, in the near future. And the idea is that students learn or achieve intercultural competencies um, when they are interacting with students or by interacting with students from another culture. That is the, the one thing, maybe the, the basic goal. The second goal is that students and we all should learn about topics related to information literacy. Um, at current times, a very important topic, uh, we guess. Um, and we do this especially uh, by taking into account transnational perspectives, which should widen our scope on the topic uh, itself, which is also an important thing. These are the two um, main goals, uh, um, basic reasons and uh, aims we want to and goals we want to reach with this project and as the map indicates at current um, two institutions university of hildesheim and uh, symbiosis college and of commerce and arts and, and pune are involved this is uh, the basic idea of the project and of the conference today and who contributed um, overall in the learning scenario the course which is the foundation um, of this conference, 27 participants took part, five instructors, you can see them here, and 22 students from Pune and um, Hildesheim, India and Germany, and hopefully, uh, possibly many more uh, next time. This is the basic idea. And what was done till now, uh, in winter term, we had a a course. Um, this, this is a short description of the course poster. We provided uh, the students um, at the beginning of, of our learning scenario. And you can see here on, on the increased um, part um, that in November we 
we started with some warm up students got to know each other in a, in a basic uh, in a task on, on basic aspects of scientific literacy then during december and january students worked collaboratively on on specific topics like mentioned here and generated a knowledge artifact on their topic uh, and with this um, artifact and with their knowledge students um, today teach us about the things that are important and or that they see as important in respect to information literacy and this is uh, these are the things we want also share with the world and this is the the knowledge sharing phase end of january here we are on the on this online conference and you've already have seen the program blended in when you logged in into the room um, this is the, the program for today. Um, we start um, at 900, uh, 950 15 hours with, uh, with uh, student session one, information behavior in Corona times immediately after this introductory session. Then we follow with at 10 a.m. with the second session, what I believe is surely true. This is covering uh, the so-called confirmation bias. Then we have a break. After the break, we um, yeah we welcome our speakers, keynote speakers from from the U.S., um, Ms. Jacobson and Mr. McKee, who will tell us about the role of meta literacy in designing open learning initiatives. Also very connected to the to the so strongly connected to the topic of the conference. Then we continue after a short break with student session three, the impact of the pandemic on the education sector. And following that is session four, how to cultivate information literacy in rural environments. And after a short break, we yeah, come to a come to a general discussion in a workshop on cultural aspects of information literacy and this afternoon or depending on your time zone evening or uh, noon um, we are closing um, the, the, the conference as you can see we have one challenge it's very dense there are not uh, not much breaks not many breaks and, and there's not much room um, to, to expand discussions as interesting as they may be in a single session, so we uh, try to, to, to conform to a strict um, time management um, get schedule. So this is the overview um, for today. Um, yeah, again, once again, we welcome you very much. And we start in four minutes with session one. And I hand over then to Ms. Mead. See you in a few minutes. Welcome again. And before we continue, I just quickly uh, want to give you some uh, technical information on uh, for today's conference. Uh, so first, um, like you already know from, from other uh, virtual events now, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, please deactivate your camera. Um, and then uh, please do not activate your microphone be before the moderator calls your name. You can then ask your question. Then if you have any questions or comments, please use the public chat on the left hand side. And when you do so, please indicate uh, whether you have a question or a comment so the moderator knows. Um, then two recommendations um, before we start with the first student session. Please use a headset. And then uh, if you have some audio problems, we suggest you to first check the preferences and then leave the conference and join again. Thank you.
Hello again, everyone. Um, now I want to invite our first student group with the topic information behavior in Corona times. Um, please activate your camera and introduce yourself shortly, group one. Um, shall I go ahead then? Sure, please. So, hello everyone. I am Atherva. I am 19 years old, pursuing BCom honors from Symbiosis College of Arts in Pune, India. I am an avid reader and a CFA level 1 aspirant. For me, the reason behind choosing this topic was to understand how information behavior is affected due to crisis like this pandemic. And me being a victim of this pandemic, I realized that what went wrong and what could have been better during the early stages of this pandemic. And I hope you get to know something about the topic and it is helpful from the artifact. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, I'm Jira Sevdani and I'm currently studying my master's in English literature and voices. Um, I want to get into research and writing ahead in my career and my hobbies are reading books and with every animal inside. Um, just as Athar said, in the beginning of pandemic, we all witnessed um, the information overload and the inf uh, that we witnessed. So that is why we cho I chose to take this topic. Uh, hello and good morning, everyone. Myself, Neha. I'm currently pursuing master's in literature from Symbiosis College, Pune, India. Uh, I like reading books and exploring new things. As Atharva and Ria rightly said that uh, how we all were victim of such like information uh, crisis during such pandemic. And uh, so we have researched and interviewed few people and brought you forward as what, what exactly things were. I hope that you like our presentation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniela and I'm 25 years old and I'm currently doing my master's in international information management and I'm really looking forward to be a part of this conference. Thank you. Your microphone is not working, I guess. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot hear you, but maybe you can say something about yourself after the screencast and you reload. We're not perfect. So thank you very much for your introduction. And now we will show the pre-recorded screencast of your group work, uh, which takes around 18 minutes. And after that, we will have around 15 to 20 minutes for questions, suggestions and opinions towards the topic. Thank you.
Perfect. Thank you very much for this interesting impact. Um, please activate your cameras again. So, as we could see, and I guess also as we experienced by ourselves, um, it is a very current and worldwide impacted topic with Corona. And searching for information and being up to date, regardless where people come from, gets or is more and more important. Um, we have a change in the amount of in way of information behavior, source usage, and the uh, personal impact of the pandemic, as you showed also in your um, presentation. We see a feeling of information overload, information avoidance even, and the influence of the well-being. So information literacy is needed and critical thinking gets more and more important. And it is not a national required competence, it is essential for every country and it needs to be considered that it may be also vary between the countries. So I guess you um, pointed out some very interesting insights of your conducted interviews and also with the fear of fake news and the importance of the credible sources. And thank you very much for that. And um, now I would like to open the discussion <clears throat> and I want to invite the audience to ask questions to the group and maybe some yeah, suggestions. We have around 20 minutes now to discuss the topic. Thank you. So we also prepared some questions. I don't know if we can also say them or if it's not necessary. Of course, um, but maybe we have one look at the chat. Um, there's a question. Uh, question. Do you think people could be educated to recognize fake news and misinformation? Should that skill be taught in school? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. I can answer if that's OK. <clears throat> and I think maybe um, th th like this is a very good question because I think nowadays it's um, very important to consider all that news, that all that information overload we get. And since the generation Z and uh, so on is um, constantly on social media and, and on the internet, I think it's more important. Um, and I think you can... Um, um, teach it in school. Um, I would uh, also suggest maybe to have like a course, especially only for um, stuff like that, because I think um, it also affects like our um, like daily life, and it's very important to teach our um, children and students and so on um, to be a critical and yeah, so that they. Do not trust everything they hear, everything they read, and um, that's really important um, for our upcoming generations too. So, I think um, that should be um, taught at all. So, really good question. In my opinion, that should be done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, when we must increase the information over Corona, how can we start to help people not to be so scared? Um, I can answer that too, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, in my opinion, you can help people not to be so scared in um, only giving them information which is necessarily so we talked in our screencast about like government restrictions that could be like 
oh, okay, the news about Corona should be have like a stamp on it. Like every news that's going to be on the uh, media that should be signed with the government and that should be like reliable and that, that there is not too much information because I think people um, are scared because there's a lot of information. They don't, do not know how to organize the information. They don't know, okay, what is right, what's wrong. And um, I think that's the reason also why the, the, there uh, is um, anxiety and people are scared and because of the pictures and videos which are shown in social media and all around the world and yeah, in my opinion, yeah, that's maybe a way to do it. Thank you very much. Um, is that okay? Of course. Yeah, um, so I remember the first couple of months of the pandemic uh, especially in my family, there was this divide where it was about one part of my family believed that uh, uh, the information that was being presented was understated, so as to not to create a panic, whereas the other part of my family believed that they are oversharing to create a panic. So um, in the end, how to not help someone being scared is also about their own perception of the news, but ultimately it's about equipping yourself with credible information as Usa pointed out. Thank you. Then we go further with another question. Um, and if we can recognize fake news, how do we tackle them? Should they just be ignored? And do we need a neutral institution that is able to delete fake news? Um, yes, so as I mentioned before, um, there could be like restrictions that's also linked to my um, what I explained like two minutes ago. Maybe like in neutral uh, institutions like Robert Koch Institute, I don't know if you can say that it's neutral, but maybe like this and um, they can, um, I don't know, have people who um, delete uh, the information which are wrong or fake news or yeah, which is not allowed to be seen um, also from children. And um, that could be a, uh, a way that um, to delete the fake news. And um, yeah. Um, also adding to what Bursa says, we can also report the uh, links or we can, if there's something that we are not, if we think that's not authentic enough, we can always report those links or uh, put down comments. Like if we go down the link section, uh, the article section, we can always put down the comments. So if you think that's not credible enough, you can put down your opinions and your views why you think that's not credible enough. And uh, talking about uh, neutral institutions, almost um, all the governments in the globe on the globe have um, certain cyber laws um, laws uh, regarding the uh, regarding the information uh, what we say um, spreading. So um, if there are a few constructive measures taken on that kind of actions, then uh, it would be really great um, if um, if the government uh, decides to take actions on those uh, fake news and reports. Thank you. Um, now, in regard of the questions, we have uh, another question. Your video mostly focused on replying on credible sources to obtain information. In the initial stages of outbreak of COVID, who arguably the most credible source released some misinformation about COVID, what can be construed as a credible source? Um, I guess. It is also um, like another question here, so maybe we'll start with that. So what can people consider as a credible source in your opinion? Um. So yes, WHO was supposed to it was supposed to be and is arguably a credible source. But also, uh, whenever the information is presented to you by credible, like it, it is always important to question it, because I think one of our points in our presentation was that um, information is all cannot always be objective either, and while you should trust organizations that are well built and provide information, we, uh, everything needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. 
and you need to be ready to revision the uh, revisit the information that has been presented to you. Thank you for this answer. Um, then we have a comment. It is becoming more more difficult for people to distinguish between truth and lies, as it is a very emotional matter. And another comment, I think that many people are too lazy to search for information they can trust. And I would even say that some people are many people able to fake news like brainwashing from conspiracy theories, which comes um, to another question. How is it possible to differentiate between helpful and fake news or even conspiracy theories? And are there criteria for society um, could follow? I think maybe you want to comment about that. I feel that uh, we should not react towards information that easily. We should take time, take a take like process because of which uh, during pandemic there were so many mental health issues. Uh, credibility does not come like we are not able to uh, recognize credibility that easily. But then we can take time to process the information. We can check uh, more websites, check uh, more information towards the same uh, thing that we are article we are looking towards. So I feel that we should uh, go through a lot of uh, research uh, to you know come to one particular point. Thank you. Adding to what Neha said, uh, while we while it is important to create a source of credible information that you believe is based on objective fact, it is also important to view that information with the critical eye and learning to accept that um, the other person can also make a mistake or misrepresent something. And just in simple, learn to question things. True. And there's another question. <clears throat> um, did you reflect on the content teach in your school or university regarding information literacy and how to check for credible sources? And would you say that it is barely part of the curriculum? So, um, do you think that information literacy got taught in your school, either in India or Germany, or that in university you had um, it included in your curriculum? Um, so, um, Daniela and I, we are in the same semester and same university in Hildesheim, so uh, we took classes, uh, especially concerning this topic, like information literacy and so on. And I think, um, yeah, that was a really good thing. And that's also the reason why we are here now. And um, the second part was how to check out for credible sources. And would you say that it is barely part of the curriculum? I, I'm sorry, I don't get the question. So I'm not sure if the others understand it. So do you mean like if it's written down in our curriculum that we have, that is, it should be like, like, I don't understand it, sorry. <laughs> Um, adding to that, um, for for me personally, our, our school did not teach us how to filter information. And in fact, even looking up information was um, very basic for us, but we weren't taught how to filter it out or how to recognize credible sources. It was only when we came to college that we were given a little bit of uh, input in it because I did a research program in college as well. But if I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gotten that big an insight compared to that, like students who did not do the research program. And um, yeah, in schools, it, it I think it is very part of the curriculum and it should be a part of the curriculum because as we are in the digital age, it is very easy for people to get lured into um, conspiracy theories and fake news. Um, there's an addition to the question about the curriculum um, that it was mentioned or thought about teaching in class and therefore in curriculum, but I guess you already answered that question. Um, so 
and we have a lot of questions here. Um, we, um, so, from, yes. So I think there is really an um, interesting question from Mrs. Giese. So how do you see the role of big companies, platforms such as Twitter and the influence uh, in this pandemic, like for example, blocking Trump's account and so on? And I think this is a really uh, good aspect because um, I think a way to control maybe this kind of um, fake news or the source also where the, all the stuff began is like an, an, a platform such as Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, like social media platforms. And I think it's really important to maybe mm, like cooperate with this kind of people who have a lot of followers like influencers or um, people who have like a lot of followers and maybe they can explain the people like the reliable stuff and maybe they can cooperate with like that's the way also to teach the younger generation since they are uh, all the time on the internet and all the time mobile and um, yeah like on social media and maybe that that could be a way to um, bring all these aspects together um, and yeah um, maybe a question which comes belong to or belongs also to social media from um, do you think that people who get their information from YouTube, Telegram, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, and so on, are more vulnerable to fake news or disinformation than people who use other sources, which is maybe a bit contradictory to your statement? Yes, I think that's really good. Oh, okay, Atavo, go ahead. Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, please go ahead. I'll build on to it. All right. Um, so the thing is, um, when it comes to YouTube, Telegram, WhatsApp, or Facebook, or any other social media app, um, these are all open-ended sources, and we can put our thoughts or any kind of information that we feel that is right. But on other sources like research paper or some uh, credible news providers, the thing is, they um, filter the content in such a way, and they have their own sources for making the information credi more credible. So I feel that um, information available on social media is more vulnerable when, com when compared to other sources. Um, to add on to that, there was in our study we also saw that there was a there was mistrust when it came to mainstream media sources, news sources, and um, they all always getting your information from YouTube, Instagram cannot. Um, it can be helpful because there is a growing account of uh, social activists that voice their opinion present the other side of the coin through these platforms simply because it is less filtered. So um, you can keep an eye on them, but it is again also important to filter these information and do your own research behind it through empirical facts. Thank you. So now there is on, there are only five minutes left um, to the next session. Um, maybe you choose your most important for your more, the most important question. You maybe want to ask the audience um, what they think about it. Um, you mean like the question we prepared, right? Yes. Okay, so I think it was really basic, just like um, how um, you all uh, were affected from the coronavirus um, concerning your information behavior. And do, do, you, do you agree with the aspects we said, like from the interviews maybe, or do you have other interesting points that you um, experienced like on your own? Thank you for the question. I see people are typing their answers. Mm -hmm. um, I 
Then we have some of some comments of the audience. So that, for example, Mrs. Jacobs agree with the point of information overload. Accordingly, one often does not know what to believe. Therefore, she thinks that Bishra has mentioned an important point that you should only give people the necessary information also with regard to the fear that many people currently have. Um, and another um, comment to the role of social media platforms in disseminating information is enormous. So take for example the US presidential elections, Twitter had to tag certain tweets as fake or not confirmed news, because news at the level can go viral within seconds, and the impact of unreliable information can be distress, civil unrest can be avoided when tweets like those are tagged. So also thank you for this comment. Um, okay, so there is no answer for your question, Usha, but another question, um, do you think we can find a middle ground between too much information and too little. Um, so I think it's about regulating your own intake because there will always be an abundance of information out there, but it's about understanding your capacity and how you perceive information, as well as um, listing down some credible sources that you can rely on in times when you need to take a step back from mental health and yet stay connected because I can provide information to you in a capsule form. Uh, but in the end, it depends on your own consumption behavior. Thank you. So I think we can, we come to the end of the session. Mm -hmm. I really want to thank you um, for all your answers and your insights of your group work. And at the afternoon, or in the afternoon, we will have a workshop session where we can discuss about this topic further and share our ideas and opinions concerning intercultural information literacy, fake news, and misinformation, and how to avoid it. Thank you again, and I hand over to my colleague um, Tessie and the second session will start at 10 o'clock. Yeah, it's not Tessie, it's, it's me, but Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you very much for, for the very interesting discussion, especially on Twitter. I think um, a few rich people decide who can post and who, who not, uh, who cannot post things, I guess. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting topic for democracy, especially. And with regard to fake information or wrong information, um, the, uh, WHO was mentioned, the World Health Organization also providing information that was not necessarily valid. So I think we need not only to, uh, to check on the source, but really to check on, 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 the, on the respective information that is provided. Even the best sources can, can be, be um, wrong uh, sometimes. But now to the to the second session, I guess it connects very nicely to to uh, the first um, session and topic and the discussion. It's about um, confirmation bias. The, the heading as what I believe is surely true, isn't it? Uh, how to correct cognitive errors to promote an open mind, and I invite um, the group to activate the camera. The cameras.
one picture still missing. We wait just a moment. Maybe we can already start with the introduction um, and, and Ms. Giza is trying to connect or reconnect uh, the camera. All right, he wa who wants to start? Yeah, I start with the introduction. Um, I'm Alisa from uh, University Hildesheim and yeah, I'm looking forward to be part of this conference. Um, hello everybody, my name is uh, Ishita. I'm in my final year and I'm studying psychology honors and I too am looking forward for this conference. Who's next? Hello everyone, mm, isn't here? And thank you for coming and I'm sorry about you. I'm a commerce student studying at Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce, Pune, India. Your microphone is not working, or I, at least I cannot hear it. Am I audible now? No, Miss Miss Shaya, Shaya, Shaya and Tani Kundu, uh, your microphone was not working. Still listen, maybe we continue with Ms. Gize and um, Ms. Kundu, you, you try again after that. Ms. Gize. Uh, hi, uh, sorry for interrupting. My, my name is Isha. I'm in my final oh. year pursuing my undergraduate degree in psychology, and I'm glad to be a part of this conference. I hand over to Rika. Yes, um, I hope you can see and hear me. I'm Rika. I'm studying international information management in my master at the University of Hildesheim. And um, yeah, we prepared also a little introduction, a short personal introduction to our uh, work on our topic um, that I would like to uh, give to you right now. Um, so uh, cognitive bias is an umbrella term that refers to the systematic ways in which the context and framing of information influences our judgment and decision making and why its cognitive biases make our thinking and decision making faster and more efficient. They also lead to a deviation from norm and rationality in judgment. And amongst cognitive biases, confirmation bias has received extensive research attention and our artifact uses a combination A little evidence to explore this confirmation bias, and we look forward to the later discussion and exchange after the end of the video. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kundo. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot hear you. Okay, maybe maybe um, after the, the presentation. Um, I will try to present um, the video now. And it's roughly 17 minutes, sorry.
Yeah, thank you very much. I again invite the group. Miss Kundo is still missing when I see it right. Just wait a bit. Okay, maybe maybe she she can make it in, in the next um, minutes. Um, I already see there are questions coming up. <clears throat> maybe I can provide a short categorization. Um, that what what it's all about, and I guess you really explained it very well, and you showed some important aspects of of research in the field, and it's it's one of the central uh, behavioral patterns humans show, and in a way that yeah, as you said it, we judge things we would like to believe uh, often as more plausible and trustworthy, and. This affects everyone, expect me, of course, we all believe, probably, uh, but we all are prone to a confirmation um, bias. And as it is um, a thing that could lead us to a situation where we are misinformed and uh, do things we really would rather not do if we would be good informed or informed in a, in a, in a, in a, in a valid way way then sometimes it's it's really a big um, problem on the other hand you covered a lot of ground with regard to the question what to do about it and i also think um this is maybe the basic aspect here and it shows that information literacy which was the, one of the uh, central aspects we came up with in the first discussion is something we need um to to reflect on ourselves on our own behavior basically, or primarily. And um, yeah, I, I think we should also not forget that confirmation bias has maybe, um, yeah, it has a purpose. It is there not without a reason. It alleviates information processing. It saves energy. But uh, the downside is uh, there are the things that you that you argued. And yeah, before we go into the, uh, uh, have a look at the questions in, in the chat, Maybe Ms. Kundo, you could try to introduce yourself again. Am I audible now? Yes. Um, so I'm I'm Shantini and I'm currently pursuing BCom honors from Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce in Pune. And I sincerely hope you liked our presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sometimes we have these technical things and video conferences, but I guess we all know. And then I <clears throat> propose we start with the discussion. And um, maybe we can make it in, in this way, like Sophie Merz showed us, I guess is what uh, was a good procedure that I as moderator um, bring up the questions and you as a group um, discuss or try to answer it and participants are also free to to ask questions uh, you could also activate the camera but maybe it's uh, the, the microphone um, um, dear audience but maybe it's quicker if you just um, type um, yeah first question uh, does confirmation bias have something to do with convenience or laziness um, Could it be possible that these confirmation bias, uh, does, that confirmation bias occurs because people do not want to deal with information or intensively with a topic? And how could people be motivated to double check their information before they spread them? You said 
some things about it. Maybe you, you can, again, um, bring up your most important points to your group. If it's okay, I'd like to begin with the answer and then my group members can add on uh, to it. So uh, maybe we can say that confirmation bias has something to do with laziness in the sense of the absence of cognitive resources leads to confirmation bias. As Sir previously mentioned, confirmation bias does serve a purpose where it leads to efficiency in thinking. So we do not have the resources to process every information around us carefully. However, uh, when we're not able to do that, it leads to uh, misdirections in thinking and faulty decision making. And that's where confirmation bias becomes a problem. So in terms of laziness, it, it can be in terms of us uh, being under information overload or lacking in cognitive resources. We are uh, wrapped with way too many tasks at hand. And in terms of uh, whether people do not want to deal with the topic intensively, it is it has been noted that if an individual does not wish to engage with the topic, or if they have a strong opinion over it, if they if they consider themselves to be an expert over that topic, there are chances that they will not engage in dissenting information with dissenting information. So yeah, there is the there is that. Uh, reasoning behind it as well. Perhaps maybe someone else can pick up now. Thank you. Or we continue with the next, next question. And this is a quite interesting thing. Does the internet make things better or worse? Um, in fact, you have the opportunity to uh, encounter a um, lot of contradictory contradictory information, for example, or di check different viewpoints. But maybe we know otherwise. You indicated that uh, too with a concept called filter bubble, I guess. What, what do you say? What is your estimation? Um, I will pick this one if this is okay for the group. Um, I would agree with that um, question. Um, once we type in our um, thoughts or our query to Google, we will get lead to forum discussions or um, yeah, maybe articles that um, correspond to our query. And I think especially with um, everyone being able to post their opinions on social networks, on different platforms, we will find um, these kind of resources um, apart from um, newspaper articles. Um, and find people that have the same opinions as ourselves. So I think um, if you already um, have like a predefined opinion or you feel yourself an expert, then when you find opinions that match that, I think um, the internet can um, strengthen that uh, bias. That's at least my, my opinion on that. I don't know if the group has other input. Um, I'd like to add on to that. So whenever we see on social media, um, on platforms, or uh, we also tend to follow the same kind of people uh, that have the same opinions as ours. So when we see information put out, usually it does cater to our own uh, opinions or thoughts, which again caters to our filter bubble. So yes, that's the point that I have to make. And sorry to drag this on, uh, but one more point is the source bias that we mentioned in the presentation, where uh, the contradictory information might not as uh, seem as uh, credible to us, which might lead to us not engaging with the dissenting information, even if it exists in a replete format in, in the online sphere. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, once again, it depends on, on, on the individual I, when I understood it. Stood it right. And the next question, uh, our line of question is, is uh, uh, twofold. The one, the first is, um, um, yeah, how to achieve an open mind? Um, if, yeah, if confirmation bias is so comfortable. And uh, the other question following immediately that um, is, is um, yeah, is open mindness something age specific, do you guess? Or what is your estimation?
are younger, older people more prone to confirmation bias or something like that? What, what do you think? So, uh, maybe I'll answer the question. Um, uh, I think it is an excuse to motivate them first to be more open minded. Uh, and how, we, how can we become more open minded? Mr. Bartrad, maybe if you deactivate the camera, the mic quality will be better because it seems it's very hard to understand you. I hope I'm able now. Mm, yeah, try to continue. Maybe it's a bit better. Okay, so uh, I think it is an institute to motivate themselves to be more open minded. Uh, can we then become more open minded if we continue? Try to find open formation, um, expand our affiliation, um, affiliation with, uh, with diverse groups, and interpreting the information in this way, giving clarity uh, to the information. And that should be our main motive to this. Uh, that should be our main step to increase uh, open mindedness. And uh, as I said, it is an individual duty to give themselves to be more open minded. And consciously trying to be more um, open minded, Sharim, as I think majority of us find open mindedness a, a step. Uh, it's an effort which should be conscious. I, 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 I'm not sure if I understood everything. I tried to, to um, the main point I acknowledged was, was uh, that it's important that you do not, as a person, you do not only circle in the same circles. Um, but you have a, a variety of social contexts in which you are confronted also with information that is diverse and, and maybe um, goes in another direction as your comfort as your confirmation bias comfort zone when I understood it um, right and maybe I don't know as a group what you think but uh, maybe younger people are, have a higher probability to 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 move in and in, in, in diverse circles than elderly people, what do you guess? Still, could this be a line of argumentation? Um, if it's be, if it's okay, I'll respond to that. Uh, I'd also like to link this to a later question that I noticed: whether confirmation bias has an age-specific bracket to it. Uh, while we're speaking of open-mindedness, uh, I would I would say that I'll. From the anecdotal perspective that we gained, that uh, younger individuals do have a tendency to uh, have more diverse circles and maybe engage in uh, dissenting, uh, engage with dissenting information. However, when we speak of confirmation bias and whether it's age-related, scientific research finds that it's not age-related. It was noted that across geographical boundaries and age gaps, we are able to observe confirmation bias. But uh, as I previously mentioned, open-mindedness as a solution might be more accessible to younger uh, populations as opposed to older generations, because psychological research also finds that with age, we get settled in our opinions and beliefs, and it is difficult to uh, engage with challenging information then. So you are our hope. OK, OK, thank you. Um, then we had this question um, from Ms. Bauer. Uh, do you think social media platforms should be held responsible for the algorithm creating these filter bubbles? This is an interesting question. Um, I will pick up that question if that's OK. Um, I think this relates to another comment that I saw in the um, chat because these are companies, they want to be profitable. So um, I think for them, creating content that um, engages the user and that is relevant to him or her um, is profitable in the end. So I think for them, it's even a goal to present us with information that keeps us on these platforms rather than us saying, oh, this doesn't fit my um, expectations or my opinion. I want to leave um, this platform. So, um, yeah, I think um, it's a very difficult um, topic um, if governments should um, make social platforms responsible for this kind of, um, yeah, concept, um, financial concept. Yeah, I wouldn't be 
social because these yeah they want to um get their money but they are all, they have a huge responsibility so i wouldn't be able to really um yeah respond to that in very concrete measures that should be taken for them to be held um, responsible maybe the others have something to add on that 15 years ago google introduced a concept like search engine result page diversity so that if you for example you search for a thing like um, diet or, or um, medical treatment or um, um, religious or whatever organization the idea was to, to provide not only one point of view maybe this is an idea but but surely um, social media uh, or one one organization um, putting in the news streams things that contradicts you and don't interest you would surely not be able to survive in the market and so uh, that's that's really maybe a kind of contradiction but on the other hand um, as research also indicates uh, the the bias or the filter bubble is more in our head than possibly in our streams or maybe it's more in our selection of information sources and not not on on, on the at least not on the search engines yeah? Okay, um, we move on. Um, H again was asked, children teach to have an open mind. Um, yeah, how to teach them? I'm, I'm interested in the, this too. On the one hand, you argued, um, yeah, one cannot do much. Um, a confirmation bias is happening independent of education, age or whatever group, culture. On the other hand, you also said we need we should um, yeah bring bring this thing or make make people at least aware of this and how to do this. This is uh, the get and the question um, I believe. How to to bring information or how to teach people about young people about um, very young people about children about confirmation bias. Perhaps I'll pick up the question and everyone can add on. Uh, I'll begin with one uh, reference to one of the studies that we refer to. It was conducted in, in a college and it was trying to see uh, the research practices of college students and how uh, confirmation bias interacts with that. I think that's highly relevant considering the context that we're in right now. Here, it was observed that confirmation bias seems to occur uh, when we're trying to extensively research on a topic for a paper as well. So we're able to observe that careful processing is expected out of us, and yet we're falling victim to something that seems to be the confirmation bias. Here, it was noticed that it is helpful when uh, uh, discursive opinion formation takes place. That is to say that there is discussion happening with other people. There are different views coming together. And it was also noted that uh, confirmation bias will occur less when critical thinking skills are activated, which seems to be the case when discursive opinion formation takes place. So I think this would be the response in terms of how open-mindedness and critical thinking can uh, respond to confirmation bias. However, when it comes to uh, younger population, when we're speaking of children, I think I may not be equipped to answer how we can do that because critical thinking in young people might be a big expectation to have. So maybe someone else has something to add to that. Yeah, um, good, good answer, I, I guess. But um, yeah, maybe it, it, it just helps if you need to be aware what are the sources, what is said here and what is the agenda. Um, of, of the people. Um, we know that many people do not know about, for example, the business model of Google, and they trust Google, and if they would think more about the business model of Google, maybe they would not so much trust uh, Google, for example. Okay, um, time slips by. We are only have a few minutes left, therefore I, I um, scroll down a bit. Again, there, there is this discussion on, on social media, so we, we see and in, 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 yeah we, we have a connection between social media 
And confirmation bias, at least in our head, maybe it's also a kind of, of confirmation because we heard just about filter bubble and filter bubble and filter bubble again. So I think we ask ourselves again if, if, if social media are the cause of, uh, of, um, of um, confirmation bias or an, an, yeah, an, an, some, uh, an entity that increases the, the problem. But maybe this is so, so fluid in our minds that we are also prone to confirmation bias. Here, I, I don't know, I just asked uh, the question. Again, people, um, thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, I have a look at the question. You have, can also have a look at the questions. Um, unfamiliar filter bubbles, querdenken, conspiracy theories. Yeah, maybe that that is that is a thing that is clearly or could be strongly related to confirmation bias, social social status and confirmation bias. Does education help? Your answers rather indicate not necessarily. And um, yeah, um, have you researched something about multicultural societies? So countries where people from different countries living door by door to other religions, e.g. Israel. Is there an ability for confirmation bias or discrimination? Um, Maybe the, the first part I, I understood. What about um, yeah? And this would can we also relate to the to our class? Does this does multi multiculturality um, counter confirmation bias in, in a certain way, or does it even increase it? What do you think? In response to this question, uh, for multicultural societies, I would say that India counts as a multicultural society considering how many language we, languages we speak and the amount of religions that exist here. So uh, the anecdotal perspective that we gained from the Indian uh, interviewees kind of hinted that when it comes to politics and religion, it's actually really difficult to engage in respectful discussion with people who have opposing views. So even though differences exist and we can see them, it might not help in countering the confirmation bias because we choose to ignore it. I would also like to quote this one part that we had an expert say to us that there is an ideological bias that exists that in interacts with our confirmation bias that kind of makes us ignore information that is not consistent with what we strongly believe. And religion and politics seems to be something that's very personal and close to people so it's not something that people want to engage in uh, just superficial discussion and it's something that involves their feelings and that, yeah. Yeah, especially a religion as a metaphysic topic. You cannot bring up some facts or something like that that is beyond facts. So um, there, I, I don't know, but, but what about maybe if we close the discussion with this point uh, can you rely on, on facts to counter uh, confirmation bias? What do you think? I say the Danube River is this has a length of more than 3000 kilometers or something like that. I guess this, that's an undisputed fact, but maybe when I la talk about economics and I talk about unemployment rates and growth and politics related to that, Maybe then confirmation bias is rather connected with the choice of the fitting arguments and not disputing certain arguments per se, but rather um, indicating that it's not that relevant here in that context or, yeah, okay. Okay, I guess we could and probably will um, discuss this topic in the next few dozen years or so, but um, still it, it is, I guess, we, we will not find an easy solution, but I guess it's still very important to talk about it um, and to talk about it in, in the context of our, of our political sphere, especially one question asked about our politicians and their confirmation bias and to be aware of that. that not only we are um, prone to confirmation bias, but also decision makers and that this could be a big, big um, problem.
Have you anything to add? So for now, thank you very much. Um, I give you a big hand and I hope the audience uh, too. But these are the things that are diminished in, in the online uh, environment. Thank you very much, uh, dear group on confirmation bias. All right, thank you too for the lively discussion. Um, we now have a break. Uh, and we continue at 1100, uh, 1130 hours um, in, in roughly 40 minutes. Um, I will deactivate the camera. We will be online, but um, it's, it's just a pause, a break now. Um, please use the break uh, because we still have a lot of work, interesting, very interesting work to do. See you in 40 minutes. <laughs>